David conducted extensive observations on plant communities, surface waters of Sandy Lake. Over the interval June till August, his objectives were to describe the area, what you see on the ground, and make some assessments of existing and potential threats to the ecological integrity of the area. David will provide a virtual tour of Sandy Lake and present his major conclusions about what he now sees as a major ecological and recreational asset for HRM. David has retired from his position as professor of biology at Dalhousie University in 2008. Since then, he's been active in several natural history and hiking groups with a focus on Shabakto Peninsula. Over to you, David. Uh, most of what I'm going to present is, um, yeah, is on this website, Sandy Lake Bedford. CA. I, when I, um, I did a lot of different types of observations and I, I'm quite used to working in the web medium and I just found it easy, easiest to put it all on a website that I can update and has links and all the rest of it. And, um, and then there's also information that, that's available on the sandylake.org and the Sandy Lake Coalition, so between the three of them. And I uh, will get the uh, slide set posted here. Uh, eventually, sooner, sooner than later, probably. The concept of uh, Sandy Lake as a regional park, as Karen will tell you, it was really um, it goes back uh, 50 years. That, that was, uh, when the, the Sandy Lake area was selected as one of seven unique jewels in the crown of the Halifax region. I actually have that old report. I always use it as kind of basic reference on what's around Halifax. Uh, one of seven priority areas to be protected for their ecological richness and for community education and recreation. Plans were developed for the Sandy Lake Regional Park at that time. So it's, it's actually an old concept. It's been a long time and hopefully being, being uh, realized. It's that original concept that it was to have land around, some lands around Sandy Lake protected as a conservation area. And of course there was much less development around there at the time. What did happen in the interim was that these lands were acquired by HRM and Walter uh, was involved in that. And, uh, and of course the Lions Club set up the Sandy Lake Beach Park in, in 2001. And then in 2006, as part of the first regional plan, these were kind of integrated as the so-called Jack Lake Regional Park, which still has not been formally designated. So it's called a regional park. And these regional parks, the idea is that they have attributes that are important to, to all of HRM, not just to the local area. So that was identified as Jack Lake Regional Park. The proposed, now proposed, Sandy Lake Regional Park is basically, the, these are HRM lands here, plus another, this is which, all this comprises about 1,000 acres, plus about another 1,000 acres on this side of the lake, because what was missing from that that part of the protection was all the all the all the land over over here, and the reasons for wanting to add that are, as I mentioned, kind of historical. Secondly, protection of the Sandy Lake to the Sackville River water course, which goes down here through here through Marsh Lake, and into the Sackville River. Uh, for the protection of migratory fish, there's anadromous, you know, seagoing species in that in that system. Uh, reptiles, amphibians, waterfowl, otters, and for the water water quality and aquatic recreation in Sandy Lake, and also to reduce downstream flooding down here. That's one. Uh, second major reason. Second was to provide a f is, is to provide a forested wildlife corridor connecting lands of the Shibukto Peninsula, which are down here, with the central and eastern mainland over here. So a kind of uh, a connectivity function. So that's, that's the reasons for wanting to expand the park beyond what it is now. This is the Sackville River watershed, which I think people here are quite familiar with, and the Sandy Lake watershed, which comprises most of these lands, but not all of the lands that are proposed to be protected. They actually involve, I think, four different watersheds. This is the Sandy Lake watershed here, or the big Sandy Lake, as we sometimes use to distinguish it from small Sandy Lake, which I think is, is it that one? I'm not sure. Yes. That one over there. By this map, is the biggest sub-watershed of the Sackville River uh, watershed. 
So obviously, you could expect that it'll have an important impact on the on the on the flooding and so on downstream, and also it's very important in relation to the efforts to um, to clean up the Sackville River system and, and get salmon going in it and so on and so forth. It's an important habitat for these species. And and I should just say that um, most of what I'm talking about, I've really only learned in about the last year and a half. I've, I was familiar with the area. I actually first met Walter, I think, in 2009 on, on some event related to the to the Greenway. Um, but and I had been to I had been to Sandy Lake a couple of times in the past, but it wasn't until last June that I really started to uh, to look at the area as a result of interacting with Karen and, and Derek and others. So I'm kind of giving you a, kind of giving you an outsider's impression, looking at it through through my, through my lens. Just one. okay. Now this is the this is the map from the recent floodplain study, and uh, they lump the watersheds. All the watersheds in this area into one sub-watershed. Um, so by those criteria, this is actually the second largest sub-watershed. Not that I think it makes a lot of difference, but just um, so my, as a matter of fact here. And this shows you. This is actually when I first met Walter in 2009. We had this field event. And that's what was happening that day. It was a wonderful kind of demonstration of the whole thing. Here's the little brown water from the little Sackville River coming in joining the big Sackville River, and here's the, the flooding downstream. So that, that made quite an impression that stuck with me at the time. And this is the uh, recent report that I'm talking about, with, with which Walter is super pleased uh, for various reasons. And it is, uh, it is really exceptionally good report. It was one big problem to me. They did not model the impacts of development in the Sandy Lake area. And I went to a, a meeting with uh, the people who did it, I said, well, why didn't they? And he said, well, HRM gave us the specifications to model. And he said they must have assumed that there would be no significant development in that area for another 100 years. So that, that's missing from the model, for the impacts of development here on this whole process. Um, anyway, these are, these are just some notes I made from my meeting with them, a few other things. And they acknowledge that uh, eutrophication is a big issue. They kind of insist when you talk to them that um, um, you know we can have development, we can mitigate all the issues, and it's not going to cause any problems with flow and all the rest of it. It's the, the standard kind of answer. They do acknowledge that's an issue, and they do acknowledge that that they did not model the impacts of development in the Sandy Lake subwatershed, which to me seems to be a huge omission. Mm -hmm. Anyway, one question to ask them, I guess, next week. Are there plans to develop around Sandy Lake? Yes, I'm coming to that. Yeah. So um, again, a little bit more detail here. This is the this is the Sandy Lake watershed. These are the lands that are proposed for protection. This whole area. This by the these are the, these are the DND lands sitting in here. These show you all of the um, these show you the the major streams coming into Big Sandy Lake. And you can see that most of them are on this western side. That's the side that's not protected. And obviously, that's going to have a big impact on the surface water. This is an area of potential acid slate input that's probably affected it in the past. You know, when you expose the acid slates, you can have this huge rush of acid. And it can kill everything in the lake. Mm -hmm. Usually does. So th th these are concerns about these waters. Uh, coming in from, the, from this direction. And there's these other smaller watersheds involved here. One component of the combined Jack Lake, Sandy Lake lands is, is Jack Lake, which is an entirely different watershed which uh, that drains into paper, the Paperville Lake system. Uh, there's a little bit over here, Marine Brook, which, which drains directly into the Sackville River. And then there's, there's some lands up here. And uh, so they want to protect this for this for the lake, and then also this whole area is envisaged as a wildlife corridor, going from the Shabukto Peninsula onto the into, onto the Nova Scotia mainland. Of concern to the Sandy Lake Conservation Association is the prospect that 892 acres zoned urban settlement just Sandy Lake could be developed to accommodate 12,000 residents. So that's the concern. We could have as many as 12,000 residents into this area, and as you remember from the previous slide, 
that's where all those waters are, water's going in there. And then there's also, of course, these, these acid slates up there. That's a, a big, big issue in terms of protection of the, of the, um, the lake system and also the, the wildlife corridor. This connectivity um, issue in a bit better perspective. This is the Shibato, you know, we call the Shibato Peninsula if you connect the line from the upper part of the Bedford Basin to the upper part of St. Margaret's Bay and draw a line. That's a peninsula. And it turns out, um, fortuitous, fortuitously and not both, it's really, the Shibato Peninsula has become a very significant conservation area. There's a high proportion of protected lands there, parks, and crown lands there. Um, and it, it's really become a very significant uh, conservation area. But, but it's isolated. And uh, you know, we're starting to see the effects of isolated fragmentation of natural habitats. And if it remains isolated, that really threatens the ecological integrity of, of that whole area. And so when they, it was the recent Green Network plan, they identified these corridors going off the Shibato Peninsula. And these ones actually around Sandy Lake were, I can't remember the terminology they used for it, but I have it there. They're not kind of main corridors, but auxiliary. But really, it should, it should be a main corridor because th this one really goes that direction. They need this one to go that, that direction. But the main point is, you know, we, there's, it's important what happens here around the neck of the peninsula. And, people, you know, people say, well, what about there's so much development there? The thing is that the more habitat you can have, you know, things move, will move over spaces or move over roads, but the longer the distance there is, the less probability they're going to get across. And, uh, you know, there's always the opportunity at some time in the future we might want to retrofit some of these settled areas to make more connectivity. But it does matter what we do with these lands along the neck. It matters a lot. And that's why in a regional context, that, that's a very important uh, issue. I encouraged uh, Karen and company, Sandy Lake Conservation Association, to try and get some drone pictures last fall, which they, which they did. They got a wonderful set of, of drone pictures. And it really gives a good impression of, of the area at large. And uh, basically, we're talking about water and forest. That's the kind of main message there. And we're talking about it kind of sandwiched between settled areas. So the next few slides just give this aerial impression. So here we are, Sandy Lake Beach Park, Bedford Basin down in here. These are all these Jack Lake lands. This is mixed, and this is lovely because it's in the fall. I also thought they should do it exactly that time of year because you could basically identify the species here mm -hmm. by the colors of the trees. So it's a typical mixed Acadian forest with areas of more soft woods and areas of more hard woods and, and so on. It's really a, really a wonderful forest. Looking north towards Peverell's <coughs> Brook up here, which goes down here through Marsh Lake and then into the Sacro mm -hmm. River. Here's the, the Marsh Lake. It's absolutely beautiful lake here. And I'll show you a picture of it later. When you, when you get in there, if you haven't been in there, it could be hundreds of miles from anywhere really quite pristine in there. And it is literally a marsh, a marsh lake. And this is uh, one of the power lines here. View to the northwest again with the power lines. And you see the forested landscape. Now this is the view on, on, on the view west. This is the big clear cut that was made in 2013. This is part of the area that, that could be developed. Was this um, just, was this the part of the jail, where the jail was? No, that's that's on the Jack Lake lands. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, looking southwest, this is towards the, the dairy. You said that was clear cut. Uh, it looked like it was clear cut, but for what reason? Uh, that's a little bit of a story unto itself, but uh, the owner at the time, was, was, as I understand it, was ticked off at the city and decided to show his muscle and clear cut. Holy cow. But the, the point is, it is private land, and it is, it is part of the, the mm -hmm. urban settlement land, and legally is on the route to development. But, you know, ecologically, and, and uh, there were effects that I'll show you later. It's clear cutting. Uh, there's a stream that comes down through here, I think. And th a, lot of the, a lot of this shallowing stuff out here is because of movement of debris from the clear cutting down into the lake. So it, it did have uh, effects on it. Yeah, I've got some pictures on the ground, and I just wanted to give a little bit 
a kind of a surf superficial geology here. So here we're looking at Sandy Lake. So we got the Shabakdal Peninsula down here, and then you know a lot of the Shabakdal Peninsula and all this area down here is a lot of exposed bedrock, and and it's the Mag hard Maguma slates and so on, the Halifax formation, and we get further down the granites and so on, very rough kinds of rock. And then this stuff here, which has these to it, with it, that you get these series of ridges in the rocks. You can see them in people's backyards and so on. And then when we, when we get into here, we get we get a different formation. And then this is going into this big drumlin field, which goes up through central Nova Scotia, through Mount Yen, Uniac, and so on. And so we've got <coughs> these big drumlins around Sandy Lake. And that's what makes it quite a, and, and these have quite rich, rich, um, hills and so on in them and that gives this whole forest and the lake system a different quality than the ones on the Shabakdo Peninsula. It's a higher pH lake which there's more calcium going into it and the forest has things like sugar maple on it which you don't get in the much more acidic systems and that's part of the transition to the central mainland and that, that's what you're, you're getting in, in, into this area. I'm going to just show you a few pictures to kind of highlight what's there and what really, somebody who really didn't know the area, what really excited me about it. And this this area here, this is one Walter said I had to go visit. And it's, um, yeah, we're, we're right here. And he said there's beautiful, beautiful hemlocks in there and it is really spectacular. And it's what's called the Moraine Brook area. And there's a series of ridges and you, you climb up these ridges and then there's little valleys and you climb up another set and there's just absolutely beautiful hemlocks and moss covered floor and they're really really beautiful and this just shows the, the topography going across a series of ridges here this is done from google earth map this is where this this transect goes and then there's a lovely big um, drumlin right up here beautiful beautiful forest on it i mean i could talk the whole night about some of these sites coming uh coming back down coming back down now there's the what they call the uh, water road. When you come back down here, almost parallel to the uh, to, to the by high, you walk down the water road, and then you come to the road that goes into the. Somebody just asked me about it, where they were going to situate the old jail, and that's what you see there. <laughs> it's really interesting. This is the one with the gate on it, off off the Hammond Springs Road. Yes, that's the water road, and then you go, if you go up the water road towards this direction, then there's a road off to the left going inland, and that's the one I'm talking about. This yeah. goes up to the old jail. And, uh, you know, these are major thoroughfares, and, and to me, has like tremendous potential. And there's bits of history strung around them. I just find it really fascinating. And this is the, um, when they, when they, Scraped the ground for the for the jail yard. They really did a good job, and it really hasn't regenerated much. But my first thought when I went in there, and I just thought, one thought came to my head. I thought amphitheater. What a wonderful place for big summer summer events outdoors. There's roads right into it. It's a huge area. It's kind of out in nature, and it's it's one of the big potentials that I see in this whole area. Uh, very close to that is Jack Lake. Jack Lake looks like a boreal lake. You know, it's got the black spruce very low. The water is very acidic. You know, the whole area is riddled with riddled with old forestry roads. There was a lot of forestry down at one time. Riddled with trails. This is a, a map of uh, trails and so on around. These are like informally constructed trails. There's the, the power lines going through these areas um, where they show here, these things here. And the thing is, these, these are all potential, really open up the area to me to different types of recreational use. So they're, they're big, big attributes of the area. This is a little bit on Pepperell's Brook. I mean, absolutely beautiful. There's a little bit of a, an ATV route through here, and it's just serene walking through there with this, this hemlock long stream. And this is on, one, on the power line up about, um, I mean, up here somewhere, I think, in, in the fall time. You know, really beautiful, very accessible uh, lands, and that's that's a big part of it. Uh, a winter shot, as you know, probably know, dog walking is quite popular there, even in winter, and the lands are used in all different seasons. And it's as beautiful in winter as it is in summer. This is Sandy Lake, with people boating and swimming. 
but this is one of my favorite shots. The father and her son out there just in their bathing suits and casting in. I saw them catch, you know, several smallmouth bass. It's an invasive species, and one way to keep it down is to fish them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, a little bit of the different lakes, so and some of the streams and so on. And I should say one of the things that uh, really intrigued me about the area when I first came out and visited Derek is here. Derek pointed down to the water and said, look out there, and there were Gaspro, a shallow water. I never had any idea that Gaspro came up anywhere near Halifax. So these fish are coming up those streams and so on and spawning in the, in the lake. Um, that's, that's Marsh Lake, very, very different kind of lake, Sandy Lake and Jack Lake. So they're, they're quite distinct lakes. And uh, these are uh, snapping turtles, Clarence Stevens. I'm uh, leaving a little group to put some of these snapping turtles back in the lake. Talk a little bit about that. So I'm just trying to give an overall impression here. Uh, and I was really impressed with the aquatic life, especially after working on the Shibakto Peninsula, when so many of these areas are almost dead. And they're dead for two reasons. One is they're naturally very acidic, but then acid rain has really hit those poorly buffered areas very hard. And when I did a, a couple of years ago, did a survey in the Williams Lake backlands, uh, hundreds and hundreds of um, vernal ponds and stuff there. One out of maybe 50 or 60 had any amphibians in it. There, this place is crawling with, amphi with rep amphibians and reptiles because it's, it's maintained a, a, a favorable, uh, favorable pH. Many of these mussels in there, which are eaten by by otter and, and um, beavers and everything else. Uh, Derek showed me this bit of pickerel weed. She said he had seen the beavers eating that. So it's a, it's a very, very uh, uh, rich system. That's just marsh lake. Again, when I pointed out, there's the point, when you go back in here, the only signs of civilization is that cut for the power line up there. Absolutely serene and beautiful. Uh, again, just some of the streams and so on and surface waters. This is kind of interesting because this was in 2017. This is in 2018. And what happened in the meantime was, or in the, during that time, is the beavers put four dams on that, on that Peveril Brook and raised the water level of the lake about two feet. For better or for worse, I don't know. But they certainly had an impact on it. And that's again that uh, lovely view on uh, Peverell's Brook. And then uh, what really <coughs> got me excited, I mean, besides that, all that I told you, were the forests. And I was really just blown away to, to discover such a such a magnificent mixed Acadian forest of lots of big old trees in here. Now the whole area was, was forested at one time, but you know, in the old days, they didn't have GPS, and they didn't have helicopters, and they didn't have this and that, and they just didn't take everything out. And some spots got left either deliberately or by accident. And there's patches of old growth all through that forest back there. And as I'll talk about, there's a lot of these what they call pits and mounds. And you can see some very sizable trees. One of my favorite ones, and this is where Derek took me the first day I came out, the so-called peninsula, which belongs to Sandy Lake Academy. And um, just a magnificent grove of hemlocks you can't believe. It's, it's like a cathedral in there. And these are over 200 years old, these trees. Okay, now this large area up here was clear cut in, in 2013. That was old growth. There's many, many big stumps in there of trees well over 100 years old. Nice. They did leave these strips here. And those areas have some of that vestigial forest, of course, with big edge effects. And those have some of the the big trees. Here's the clear cut looking from across Sandy Lake. They did cut very close to the stream in some places. Here they wanted to cross that stream and they just cut right down to the stream. And a lot of stuff did go into the lake and this is what came in. And that's up in this northwestern part of the lake. And that, that is a type of eutrophication. There's no question that adds to the oxygen consumption, nutrient loads and so on and so forth. So it, that wasn't a free pass as far as the lake's concerned. And if you develop it, 12,000 people, it's hard to envisage that's not going to have 
a major impact. Major impacts. I was, I was approached to see if I do quote a floral survey. And I told Karen, I said, I, you know, I don't do floral surveys, but uh, what I will do, I said, after looking at it for one day, I said, what I'm really excited is, is not looking for rare species, because you probably won't find a lot. I'm sure you can. But what I'm really excited, what's common there? Not what's rare there, but what's common there. So I said that what I would do is describe what you see on the ground, try and document what are the significant ecological attributes, make some assessment of existing or potential threats to the ecological integrity. And then as I went along, this became important to me. As I understood how much it's currently used for recreation, how much it could be used for recreation, it kind of gave more thought to that. And I, ha I have a background. I was, I've been 10 years with the, almost 10 years with the uh, Bluff Wilderness Organization, including three years as co-chair. So I'm very familiar with what's involved in, in managing uh, trails and so on and so forth. And I got quite excited when I, when I began to understand uh, really what's there. And my methods are very low tech. It's basically me in a backpack, backpack with a camera and some pretty minimal equipment in it. I uh, often had this, this guy with me, uh, Derek. And um, I did, you know, it's, it's descriptive stuff. But my focus is really on land, on description of the plant communities, on the kind of nature of the forest. I tried to document everywhere I walked all trees that were at least 16 inches and larger. And I did, I'll talk about this pit and mound topography. Uh, and then on the water, I looked at the extended species composition of the wetland fringe, the aquatic plants. I don't have much of that in this presentation, but I did a lot of it. I did routine measurements of electrical conductivity and pH using very sophisticated equipment I could carry in my pocket. So these pocket meters, electrical conductivity is a very easy measurement. It's quite rigorous, you know, it's quite, um, it, it, it's quite robust, the measurement. Mm -hmm. pH is a little trickier. You have to make sure you calibrate it and so on. But um, those two things can tell you an awful lot if you're just doing them routinely. And, and I use that a lot. And then um, also on one day, we borrowed, we borrowed equipment from St. Mary's University to do profiles in, the, uh, in Sandy Lake. And th those are kind of the focus. And I, I mentioned Derek, and this is uh, Ed, Ed, Glover's, Ed Glover's boat was borrowed for, the, for these measurements. And then also Colin Gray, I, interacted with the, I invited Colin Gray to, to um, help me document some of the old growth forests. He's from the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. And then laterally, I got involved with Bob Guscott, who's a guy, with, you probably know him, people here, retired from DNR. And uh, we've done some of this pit and mound work together. Okay, now, I have been accumulated over the years, and this is the work of Karen putting all that stuff together, but you know, there's a fairly good list of, of, uh, of the fauna and the, and the fish. It's, there's certainly more that could be added here, but at least there's, there's some list of these things here. Clarence Stevens from the Halifax Field Naturalist, a really superb field naturalist, has been doing studies there. So there's a fairly comprehensive list of these things. And you know, my focus is on plants. I'm just trying to say I didn't really cover these things. And I'm not I'm not a I'm not a skilled bird watcher, so I couldn't do that. But it's nice that they have that information. And uh, just um, I just took some of that recently. This, this is just from um, an article where they listed some vertebrate species associated with certain structural features of older forests. I just happened to have that list. I thought, I'll go back to the other list, see how many of them are around Sandy Lake. And they're almost all around Sandy Lake. So what it means is that it's supporting this old forest fauna. And, and that's, that's important. And that we're talking about things that are associated with certain structural features. But there's another feature of the, these forests that's important. They're, they're large and they're extensive. It's a big patch of forest. And so you have things of the forest interior there, such as the oven bird. And they don't occur where, they, where it's very patchy because there's, there's too many things coming in from outside that will, will eat them up. You know, they nest on the, on the forest floor and so on. And this, you know, pileated woodpeckers, typical example of older forests that need these big old trees and, and dead wood and so on. So the, these two types of studies are complementary. And I'll just mention something else very quickly. 
what they think is significant is that there are lots of predators in here, the bobcat, coyote, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in here. And there's also there's also deer, and there's also the deer mouse. And do we know what the deer and the deer mouse carry? In the bunch. They, they carry Lyme disease. Lyme. Exactly. Oh, wow. And um, there's, there's, it's, it's been now quite well documented from New York State, which is really the center of, of Lyme in North America. They've done quite detailed studies now because they have so much data on where Lyme occurs and this and that. And there's pretty good evidence that forest fragmentation is a big predictor of Lyme disease. And the reason is, they've even gone into mechanism of it, the reason is that where the forest it remains intact, you have lots of predators eating the deer mice. And it's the deer mice that are the kind of controlling factor in the level of Lyme disease. So the fact that you have that huge forested area there, I think, is really important in breaking, you know, reducing as much as possible the spread of that Lyme disease. And um, just a kind of anecdote, Derek over here is quite paranoid about, <laughs> about ticks, and so am I. But anyway, in our, in our journeys, we always watch for them. And the only time we ever encountered them was in a clear cut. Derek had five on his pants. I had none because I was, I had, I had uh, tick repellent clothing on. I never, never, and you know, I'm looking for them. Never encountered them in the forest. Now it's not an absolute, but it's just it's, it's some indication of why these things are good for us. Trying to move a little bit more into the this whole area. Um, you know, what are the what are the assets of this this area? So I've classified in terms of services. Two big services, conservation of regional biodiversity and ecosystem services, and social and health benefits. This is related primarily to forests and surface waters. And these are some of the components over here. Diverse forest types, all major tree species, fi approximately 50%, maybe higher. I don't have an exact number, but it's in the area of 50% multi-aged old growth forests. Habitat for a wide variety of species, connectivity to the Shibato Peninsula. Surface waters, water storage. Sandy Lake is a deep enough lake that it stratifies, so that, and it keeps cold water for the salmonids on the bottom. It has a relatively high pH, around 6.5, so it, it's hospitable to salmonids and so on. It, as I mentioned, has abundance of, of frogs and turtles and has a lot of other life. And then the social and health thing is really wildland recreation, close to high density residential areas. Now, why did it do that? I'm stepping on you. Guys. Get a cord. Get the cord. Oh, that's right. Well, <laughs> that was psychological. Or something. So I think this is very important that there's, and, and I've, mentioned, I've mentioned some of these things going through here. And we're talking about diverse recreational activities being possible here. And I think this is really important. You know, if you look at all the new development coming out of Dubai High and so on. And here you have right there this huge area for recreation. So what I want to do now is sort of <coughs> focus on my main conclusions about the surface waters and then about the forest. Now I'm a little nervous here be, yeah, because Joe Karakis is here and Joe Karakis is one of the fathers of uh, some of the theory about how lakes develop and so on, but I'm, I'm glad he's here. <laughs> um, anyway, we have, we have uh, three lakes here in the system. They're quite different lakes. And this is some this is some old data, and you can see that the um, Sandy Lake is by, by far the, the largest. It also is much deeper than the other ones. Uh, what else about it? Yeah, the retention time is um, that means yeah these flush much faster. This this one flushes much slower. This shows you some of the some some of the this is from 1984 I think. These, these lakes are on the, towards the alkaline side, I mean higher pH. Jack Lake, as I mentioned, that's that kind of boreal type lake, very acidic. Conductivity is something I always look at. Jack Lake has very low conductivity. These ones have higher values, talk more about that. And these have more, much more calcium, which sort of affects a lot of the species and 
so on in it. Um, yeah, and then th these are some data I got last year which show the same trends between these different lakes. What does calcium do? Does it make it more acidic or more, more basic? Make it more basic, but it's also an essential nutrient for um, things. So there, there is a, quite a detailed study done that was conducted on the Sandy Lake watershed and on the on what's known about the water qualities and so on. This is the Sandy Lake watershed final report study, the ACOM study, which is really quite a thorough study. Had some big issues with it that, that, that have been registered. But it was quite a, quite a thorough study. And it was intended to represent our current understanding of environmental conditions, application of the phosphorus model, numerical narrative of how development may impact water quality. We identify several methods that can be utilized to mitigate water quality impacts. So that, that study is, is available as a backdrop. And here are some of the really the guts of what it shows. So this shows you the total phosphorus, and this is all based on stuff that Joe and other people did years ago as, as a predictive model when you go from oligotrophic, which means nutrient poor. And nutrient poor in lakes is good. It means you don't have lots of algae and so on clouding up the water and consuming the oxygen. Generally, that's considered a desirable thing. This is where they, it gets higher higher nutrients and then eventually fills in with aquatic weed and so on and so forth. And you know, the aquatic people found that they can relate this overall condition to the total phosphorus. It's a measurement they take from the water. And, and when the ACOM looked at the historical data, they could see that the lake had generally moved from oligotrophic to mid-mesotrophic between 79 and uh, 2012. So that's the historical thing. Here's what they say are their water quality objectives and early warning values. And my problem with this is, is this. They're saying that when they develop it, this would be their objective, to maintain it in this level. My problem is, is why wouldn't it be to move it back to a mm -hmm. Because that movement here rep represents the effect of urbanization. And especially with climatic warming and decreased solubility of oxygen and so on, we need to move these lakes wherever possible backwards. So to me, and this is not discussed in the report, it's just stated, that that's our objective. So, you know, just looking at that again, as I say, kind of an outsider looking at it, I, I raised a flag with me. Now, in a, in a sense, the, this, this, is, this is a kind of surrogate for estimating what's really happening in the lake. And a lot of what you're trying to predict is, is what's happening to oxygen, especially in the deep waters. And the idea there is that as you have higher total phosphorus, there's more productivity, there's more stuff to sink down, <coughs> consume oxygen in the deeper waters, and then make it go too low for the salmonids. They need relatively high oxygen concentrations. So the real measure of what's going on in the lake really is not total phosphorus, but is oxygen and temperature. And so um, I did these, just did a set of profiles last in uh, 2017 with Derek looking at temperature, electrical conductivity, and oxygen. And uh, we did this at three locations, the deepest one. This is Ed Glover's map here, here. And then we did one, one site down here. And um, this, is a, this is a typical stratification for temperature. Okay, this was done, I think, in October. I couldn't get this equipment earlier. So you have a, you have a relatively high temperature here. You reach what they call a thermocline, and it goes down. So you're going between 17 degrees here to 6 degrees in the bottom. This is where the salmonids like to be. I'll skip that this one for a second. Then oxygen does this and goes down here. So you're getting oxygen consumption in, in, the, in these uh, lower waters. This one was, a, is, was surprising and not surprising. Conductivity is essentially a measure of your salt content. And if the lake's relatively pure, you, sh you shouldn't have this. But what happens here is when you go down to six to seven meters, at the same point that you're getting this decline, you're getting an increase in conductivity. And that, that's a matter of concern. It means that you're getting salts accumulating in the bottom of the lake. And at some point, 
that can increase the stratification of the lake and reduce oxygenation. But also, it's a kind of indirect indicator of urban input into the lake, and that can mean organic stuff going in and consuming oxygen. So, so those are things. Um, those are things of concern. And I hope I'm not way oversimplifying this, Joe. Now, the other thing I did, as I said, I always carried these little meters around with me, and I would just when I met a, found a stream or something, I'd measure the electroconductivity, I'd measure the pH, so I had the meter and measure the temperature and so on. So, doing that kind of measurement, I I could get some ideas of where, essentially where the dirty water is entering the lake. Conductivity tells me that. So, and these kinds of areas have very low conductivity, 27, 22, 45, and so on. Get into the lake, we get up values around 170. Now, historically, the oldest values are around 50. So that represents urbanization influence. Where is it coming from? A lot of it's coming in this stream down in here. That's where we're getting high values here. So that's kind of how I use those those simple measurements. And um, this kind of integrates some of the different measurements. So first of all, oxygen. How much oxygen do we need? Um, am I looking? Yeah. This just shows you the oxygen requirements for um, protection of aquatic life. Um, Yeah, for warm water, warm water life, cold water life, these are, these are the salmonids, these are the other types of fish species. The, these ones need more oxygen than the other ones. And it shows you the critical values. Now this is, there's very little historical data on oxygen in the lake. There is one study from 1971 where they measured the oxygen at 18 meters. And it had a value of 5 milligrams per liter. When we measured it, it was 2.25. And that is down below these guidelines. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. That though that oxygen level in the lower parts of the lake is, is down into to critical levels. So it's a so it's a, a matter What is a critical so, level? Well it's gonna be in this area here. Oh, okay. In this area in this is kind yeah. of in this general area. And this is I mean this is close to it. This is definitely down where you don't want it for salmonids for sure. So I'm just saying, you know, and that's just one measurement, you can, whatever it is, but it's a measurement. You know, you can do all the measurements of phosphorus and models and everything else, and you go out and measure the oxygen. I was modeled up because of the uh, dead trees and stuff that was there in the clear cut. Some of it, it's, it's probably more, it's just organic material coming into the lake by Johnson's river. That, that's the big problem. And then pH, historical pH and conductivity. And the thing what I'm kind of arguing is that you have to be careful how you do it, as I'm sure Joe will tell me, but you can kind of use conductivity as some indication of, in general terms, how much garbage is going into the lake. So here are historical values going from 1955-1971 up to now. And the big changes are roughly from from uh, 19, between 1980 and 1985 onwards, going up. And then these are these are data for HRM lakes. They used to do these synoptic surveys, and this is a theory, well, it's the same thing, electrical conductivity, but for a whole series of lakes. Sandy Lake was relatively low down here historically, meaning a relatively clean lake. These are the dirtier lakes. This is a relatively clean lake, but going up. Okay, so all I'm arguing is that you can you can kind of use that as a surrogate, it's just data that we have, to look at what's going on in the lake, and, and it's a matter of, um, you know, I'm suggesting it's a matter of concern. So then the uh, the question then becomes, where did I go here? Sorry. I was, I was there. No, it's here. Yeah, then the question is where? <coughs> So I, I showed you this map before. These are the surface waters going into Big Sandy Lake. And then as, as I said, I've me measured the conductivity <coughs> of all of these lakes and so on to try and get an idea where this, where the, in, you know, the, the, the just called dirty stuff for now is coming from. So these are electrical conductivity values around the edge of the lake down one day with Derek. The, the, the yellow one here. 
And you can see a big spike down here, Arnold Johnson's book, a huge spike. That's that's where they that's where the stuff is coming from. It's coming mainly from from down here. And with that. And uh, a lot of other measurements that I did of this sort <coughs> show so the same kind of general thing. Where you have waters flowing from intact landscapes, you have very low conductivity. Where it's coming from the more settled areas, you have the higher values. And then this fall I decided I realized I hadn't really looked enough down here, this is this is where Johnson's Brook comes into the lake. I want to know what's going on here, and then we know that there's a there's a um, sewage treatment system upstream here that comes in down here. So I, I, I went out and measured uh, the conductivity values in some of these streams. And um, <coughs> anyway, the surprise. And this one, this is the 125 coming here. That's the one that carries some sewage effluent. And at this time, there, there was a lot of water flow. The, the streams are really full. These values would like to be much, much higher when there's lower flow. This is the one that uh, surprised me. Right across here, this is the road to the dairy here. Coming out of here, out of this construction area and some homes and stuff down here. This water looked bad. It was cloudy and it was full of stuff. and didn't look good. It had very high electrical conductivity. And that area, as far as I can see, wasn't identified in the PCOM study as, uh, as an area of concern. But I think uh, Karen told me that Sandy Lake, or sorry, uh, Sackville River people did identify it some time ago. And this is the area I'm talking about here. And this is the, the actual culvert here. And it was really lucky looking stuff coming out of there. Now, one of the uh, one of the things that um, I like to use also as a kind of complement to that kind of looking at those types of things are the aquatic plants. I've been kind of it's just it's partially a hobby of mine, trying to get to know them and looking at them and so on. And one encouraging feature is that is is that um, the major uh, fringing aquatic plant around most of Sandy Lake is the bayonet rush, and bayonet rush seems to be generally associated with more oligotrophic lakes. Where you get up around the inlets and so on, you get more types of aquatic plants, characteristic and more inputs. <coughs> but one thing I'm sort of suggesting is, is that it's a good idea to keep an eye on what's happening to some of those aquatic plants as some kind of indication of what's happening to the system over, it's not, I'm not, I'm not over near it, system over time. So just so just to um, I don't want to go on too much longer because <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in here, but I'll go through the forestry stuff fairly briefly. And these are DNR maps, and uh, basically what the purple shows you is old, mat um, mature to mature multi-aged old growth forest, and there's a lot of it around Sandy Lake, and that's unusual in Nova Scotia today. You know we hear all the stuff about clear cutting and so on. I mean that that is a is, is, a, um, is a huge asset to have all of this forest around Sandy Lake. Now, there, there are some differences in composition, when, especially when you go into the Jack Lake land. It's much more softwood in here. I think there's probably more cutting in the past. It's also a more acidic system. And you get some lovely, lovely hard mixed, uh, uh, mixed forests and, and hardwoods up in here. So this is, again, part of that uh, huge asset that I see for Sandy Lake. So as I said, uh, when I was all, all my treks, I, and I, I think I showed this slide way back, I said basically I did treks all through the whole area. And every time I'd see a tree that was 16 inches or larger, and I got pretty good at recognizing them because I'd measure them too, um, I would make a note about it. And then I am able to make maps like this. And what I was trying to do was to put together where there are clusters of big trees. And this is an example. This is down around. This is the parking lot. And the bigger the circle here, the bigger <coughs> the tree. You know, different species for different colors. So you can see clusters of these big trees in here. And then I got uh, Colin Gray to come in with me and do these old growth assessments. And um, we looked at three sites. We looked at a site dominated by white pine here behind the parking lot, a site dominated by eastern hemlock here. 
and the mixed forest is dominated by hardwoods up here. So these were just examples. There's more of them around here, but these are patches I identified that looked to me like old growth. And so, and uh, another one that uh, actually Ed Glover had already that beautiful forest on the uh, beautiful forest on the peninsula. Ed Glover had got DNR in there a few years back to do an assessment on that place. And then I'd also done ages in the clear cut, and we also aged one tree over at Derek's place. So these are the um, these are the average ages of the bigger trees. It's a complicated number, but just take it like it is. These are the maximum age that we observe at these different sites. I want you to look at these numbers. 136 years, 134 years, mm -hmm. 141 years, 126, 100 plus. Over here, just looking at, at the stumps. So these are our old forests. And um, again, the same numbers. So to me, what's exciting about it is you have kind of, you know, you have the mixed Acadian forest, and it comes in different flavors. And basically, you've got all flavors in this forest. So we've got areas dominated by white pine, by hemlock, uh, hardwoods, and so on. And this is, the, this is the peninsula forest. And it has all these, these features of old growth forests with lots of dead wood in it, widely spaced trees, and so on, et cetera, et cetera. And then also the, the forest floor is not level but has pits and mounds. Now before you leave, that 211, that's 211 year old tree. Yeah. Or trees. Yeah. Not necessarily the oldest tree there, it's <coughs> the oldest one that they measure. So these pits and mounds, they, they look like this. And uh, this to me is really fascinating. It's something I only learned about relatively recently. And um, people are really only become more aware of. What these mounds are, are they, they represent an old growth trees that blew down. And the stump fell over and the soil came over them on the mound. And what, what they mean is when you have a bunch of them like this, it means this is a very, very old forest. It's not only as old as these trees, but it's as old as these trees. So these are like almost like burial grounds inside the forest. And um, this is a woman, a, a Russian woman, who Donna, Donna Crossland at Kedgy got down here in the early 2000s to look at stuff. And she's been coming more and more down to Nova Scotia. And she's a world authority on these pits and mounds. And basically, she can go in here and tell you, and tell you what species it was that was in that previous forest. And these are forests. This, is, this mound is formed by blowdown. And the tree blows down. I'll, I'll show you a diagram of this. She also looks at the presence of charcoal because sometimes they burned afterwards. And um, anyway, it's revealing a lot about the dynamics of our forest. And these forests are full of pits and mounds. So it's one thing that really got me excited. So this is kind of a story of wind. It blows it over, you have an uprooted tree, it starts to decompose, you get a mound. The other thing about it is it's actually a preferential place for new trees to grow. So almost all of the trees you see are on mounds. They're not in the pit. They grow on the mounds here. And uh, this is an example. This is a tree that, that's grown over, and there's actually already trees growing up on, on top of it. Now, the, the trees blow down. They blow down in a certain direction. And you can tell from the orientation of the mound what direction that tree fell down on. You look across it. So what I did was, I looked at the direction of tree fall for, uh, which one is, okay, yeah, for, for the mounds. And then also there's a lot of Hurricane 1 fall out there. I looked at the direction of tree fall for Hurricane 1. And they all fall in this kind of section of the, of the compass, both the old ones and the new ones. And what that means is, is that the winds that blew them down came from down here. They came from the southeast. And those are hurricane winds that came down there that blew these, blew these forests down. And I, I was actually uncomfortable with this because I thought, they sh I thought, you know, the hurricanes come up the east coast, they should come up this way. 
And anyway, I talked to Don and other people. It turned out Bob Guscott had done almost identical measurements that I made at Grand Lake and got virtually identical results. So a huge wind event blew a lot of these forests down X years ago. How many years ago? Well, roughly, the age of the oldest trees on, is the, the age of the, of the mound. Here, here's a mound. And the age of that tree in there is the age of the oldest trees that you find on the mounds in an area. And add 10 to 20 years because you measure the age at that height takes time to get going and so on. And our age, remember I gave you those age numbers, 140 years. 140 is 160. So this makes, in the region of 1857 to 1867. And it could have been, for example, the famous Saxby Gale. But there was a big wind event, and actually what, since then, Bob and I and, and other people have been looking more and more at this, was this woman, this Russian woman, um, anyway, there's, there's a story developing about wind and forests in Nova Scotia and, and how we've had these huge blowdowns in the past. Okay? And one was another one, mm -hmm. a similar one. Then the peninsula one are, are older, so that would have been a windstorm that occurred in this area here. So it's just, you know, there's an interesting story that's developing there. And what's interesting about it to me is, is that you don't see this in a managed forest. You don't see it in the managed forest because they pulverize the ground and because also because they take the big trees out and the mounds don't form. And so that's one of the real values of these intact natural systems is that you can see all these processes going on. And uh, it just, you know, it gives it a lot of, I think, value and interest. And another thing, I'm not going to go into detail about this, but I do have it described on the website. Another thing I discovered was this. It's what I call, it's an intimate association between yellow birch and hemlock, which I call the Acadian forest love affair. And I think it gets kind of passionate at times. And actually what you're seeing here is that this is on a mound. This mound is eroded. When this er eventually erodes, you're going to see that. And so there's a very intimate association of yellow birch and hemlock. And there is an explanation about it, but it's a little lengthy. And I, I won't go into it now. It's just a really fascinating story that was told by these woods we have at Sandy Lake. Nobody had ever told that story before. So it's not, another kind of really interesting thing to me, which you would not see in a, in a managed forest. So I'm just trying to highlight. And oh, part of the story here is, is that yellow birch likes to grow on hemlock tip overs. That's actually been documented. That is their preferred habitat in a natural forest. So here's a Hurricane Juan tip over. Hurricane Juan was what, 2003? Mm -hmm. There was a yellow birch on the estimated to be 12 years old. It got there very quickly. But it's just, and, and again, what I'm saying is you don't, these are things you see only in, in natural forests. So I, I think you can see I get a little excited about it. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, you know, are wonderful attributes. So to go very briefly, uh, challenges to ecological integrity of Sandy Lake. I've sort of been over this a little bit, water quality. Power boats, I would say, is an issue because it, um, uh, you know, they, a lot of the wetlands around Sandy Lake are quite shallow wetlands. They're very important for the amphibians and so on. And the power, power boats definitely disturb everything there and uh, are not helpful, let's put it that way. And base of species, I've had a little bit of a concern about Rosa Maltiflora. I'll show you that in a little bit. There are some aquatic things I think we should be keeping an eye out for, such as the Chinese mystery snail. <laughs> <laughs> hemlock woolly adelgid, I think. Has everybody heard of the hemlock woolly adelgid? No. That is a pest of hemlocks, which was just recorded first in Nova Scotia last year, 2017 it could destroy our hemlock forests. It's already destroyed some large patches in southwest Nova Scotia. So that has big implications. It's something we should keep an eye out. This is what, when you, if you see this looking on the underside, that's what it looks like. And of course, development uh, has, has 
big potential impacts on, on a lot of things. And then recreational, recreational use itself can also be highly damaging. And I want to kind of end on the recreation. Oh, this is just Rosa multiflorus thing we haven't really been aware of. Um, this, this is down when you come in by the rifle range and look there. And what I do is I do surveys of this in early July when it's flowering and you can pick them out. So they're only there. And I'm willing to predict that over the next five years you're going to see it all over this area. Not that you know you may or may not be able to do anything about it, but it is, is an issue. Um, recreational use, I know from my experience on the Bluff Trail, um, you know, when I was at the Bluff Trail, we went from a phase of trying to get people interested in going on the trail to say, oh, please don't come anymore. We can't keep up with you. Many, many impacts once people start really using, uh, really using these areas. And, uh, you know, I say that in general, in HRM, as, as we start to get more of these trails and so on, we really have to develop a leave no trace asset. You know, we really, have, it's not, it's enough to protect an area, but then we, we have to take care of it. And, th and that's, uh, that is a real issue for, in many respects. But then uh, what I'm really excited about this whole area are the incredible recreational potential there are on these lands over here. These are some existing trails, more or less. Um, and the way I'm kind of looking at it, whoops, oh, yeah. Oh, oh no, did, no. Not there. I guess, uh, you know, it's just a, a concept of how it might be looked at. That to the west and north of the lake, you, you know, we should try to give priority to these corridor and conservation things. But this area, this whole area to the east can be integrated conservation and recreation. Already is a lot of recreation. And that would be one way to look at it. These, these are kind of ac existing access points, these yellow points here. And uh, the next <coughs> one shows you just, just gives some idea of the, of the many uses that are possible in that area that exist in the area and the money that could be used and you know th there's lots of existing corridors the power lines and so on this this water road going up here i mean you can you know you can open the gate here and you can drive vehicles up here and you can have summer events here if you want to in a controlled way obviously uh and as, as i kind of see it you can have and and it's right next to these the subtle areas so it's, it's kind of perfect for HRM. And I think one way to look at it is another factor about it is there's kind of a noise gradient. If you're in here and you want to really, you know, there's some beautiful forests in here, but you want to ear wear earmuffs because of the by high. But people on mountain bikes and so on, they're not, they're not very concerned about that. So, and same, there, there's some dirt bikes and a little bit of ATV use and so on. So to me, you could, you could channel a lot of that kind of use closer to, to that area. And then have these for more for more gentle activities up here, and there are all these different kinds of activities that are that are possible here. So to to me that's that's a huge huge attribute of of that that area, which is not shared, for example, by by Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes. Those are wilderness trails. And I have to say that one of the reasons that I'm excited about this is to get people off of the block trail. But the wilderness trails are single track user trails and where they're heavily used, they're getting destroyed. And the people who are going on them, I'd say 90% of them, they just want to go outside and have a walk in the woods. They don't really, you know, not necessarily want to go on, on a wilderness trail. And the thing is there are lots of large venues here that more or less exist already that people could, um, could go to. And in general, I guess my view of it is that, you know, if you take HRM today and take HRM 50 years from now, we're going to have the same amount of land, less, but a lot more users, and there's a lot more people using. So we need all of the areas like this we can get, in part so we don't destroy them, and then we need to take care of them. But I think this area has tremendous potential that way. You know, in a very positive way, I hope. Uh, so to me, the whole thing fits in uh, very nicely with our recently announced 
green net plan, which of course includes all the conservation and recreational and other uses. And those are the reasons I'm excited about Sandy Lake Regional Park. And that's it. I'll ask the first question, then I'll turn it okay. over to the floor. We already got a thousand acres. All those wonderful things you showed us, we, we got. Why do we need another thousand acres? You weren't listening, Walter? The, ra the reason is, yeah, no, no, it's a good question because that's what people need to understand because that's what they say. I think that's why Walter asked a question. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that he's got the answer. Mm -hmm. the, the reason is that it's kind of fortuitous, the land that, what, that we do have protected there, we should definitely keep. But it does not protect, you know, going back to the, some of those earlier slides, it does not protect the integrity of, Sandy, of the Sandy Lake watercourse mm -hmm. because most of the surface waters are coming in on oh, the western the side. And that's where they want to slap up to 12,000 people. Yeah. And if they do that, that will destroy the integrity of that system. Well, well there's, there's a number of holders private, there. Private in a sense, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't really look at it as a culprit. I, to me, it's a society choice. And then, and then the other factor is this, this um, corridor function to the Shabakto Peninsula. I mean, this is a reality. You know, I hear every day about how we're losing species and moving, losing this and that. We have still have a choice to, to not do, not proceed as fast in that direction as, as we might otherwise, and, and that's a critical corridor area. So those would be my two main things, Walter. Okay, anyone? Yes, sir. Uh, two, two questions. One, you showed the conductivity yeah. from 55, and was that 40? Yes. And now it's uh, more than around 100. It's 170, more or less now. Depends on the time well, of year, of course. Seen, uh, normal change. Yeah, but I think it's it's consistent in general. What's happening so overall with the Halifax well, Lakes? Yeah, these are the values up here. Yeah. And then all, all of these, all of them show this upward. You know, because so these, these are time courses. That's already changed incredibly from 55. Yes. But. Yeah. Why can't we walk it backwards? You know, yeah. for instance, when, you know, I'm just saying if you've got that one stream coming in there, which is a really stinky stream, mm -hmm. clean it up. Why can't we clean it up? And the other question, do you have any measure of water color on that? You know, all I did, John, was I made a few sucky disc measurements. But I don't have, I don't no, have. No, no color. I have no color, yeah. no color measurements. The water is not, it's not a, um, you know, it's not what I would call a brown lake. No. It doesn't have enough, you know, black spruce swamp and stuff yeah. around it. So it's not, it's in general not dark, although I think Ed said that this fall when he was out in the boat, the whole lake had turned brown and presumably stuff had washed down from the hinterland. So that's yeah. turbidity we're talking about. Uh, no, it's the actual color, which is, I mean, Joe could tell you better than me. It's the humic acid and so on in it. I think that's what you're asking well, about. Which is uh, the indication of sparkling bogs. Yeah. On the range. Yeah. But that's not the problem. Here. Yeah, there's not a lot of low lying, swampy, acidic land around. Questions, anyone? Um, one thing, I, one thing that I'm willing to do, I'm sort of taking this on as my role within the Sandy Lake Conservation, is people want to organize a lot. I'm happy to take them. A surprising number, actually. It's just not well known, but there's, yeah. there's a lot yeah, of use out there. Every time I've gone, there's been at least yeah. five cars at that tiny little. Now the parking lot is blocked off. And there's a lot of winter use. At that time, there's, an up to, there's more up 20 or more. Yeah. And runners. I mean, uh, this fall I took a group up on the, up in the drumlin up by the rifle range. And uh, you know, there's long distance runners. They just they love it going up there. And there's a lot of these people using this place. And the mountain bikers, they're, they're nuts, man. They're, just, they're incredible. I mean, they take care of the place and so on. and. Mm -hmm. And they have their little area there, and they but they've got these amazing runs, which I guess are you know they're quite popular. They're pretty. So it's just that's why to me it's really exciting because there are all these possible uses. You can accommodate a lot of people. It needs management, obviously. But anyone else? No question. A small token of our appreciation. Oh my God. A famous <laughs> oh. Sackville River. Yeah. I'm so, I, I have two, oh, but I don't pictures. have a late one. Yeah. I, I love summer them. use. I wear, summer them, use. I wear them everywhere. <laughs> Smile, Dave. Oh, that's nice. Yeah.
to get one there. There you go. <laughs> anyway, th I really appreciate that. And Walt Walter's uh, one of my heroes, so. Uh-oh. Well, thank you all for coming.